to Hotel Bar Sessions, the podcast where three philosophers sit down at the end of a long conference day to chop it up at the hotel bar, which, as we all know, is where the real philosophy happens. Welcome back, everyone, to Hotel Bar Sessions. I am today's host, Charles Peterson, and I'm sitting here with my splendiferous co-hosts, Liam Johnson and Rick Lee, and our special guest, Justin Weinberg. I think we're all thirsty. I know I am. So let's get some drink orders and let's get some rants or raves in. Lee, you want to start us off? Sure. I'm going to have my regular. I'm going to have a Fireball and Diet Coke. Don't laugh, Justin. And today I am raving about the very last days of spring. As you know, I'm in Memphis. Nobody's looking forward to the summer here. But we've got a few days left of this really pleasant, really beautiful weather. So that's what I'm raving about this week. All right. That sounds good. Rick, what do you got? I am going to have a French 75 Noel. And this week I am ranting about the closure of Lincoln College. Lincoln College is one of the very few historically black colleges and universities we have in Illinois, and they were doing okay, but COVID hit them really hard, and they just can't make a go of it. So they are closing. Let me rave a little bit about how well they're helping their students place out into different universities. I think they're doing a remarkable job. So I'm mourning the loss of Lincoln College. Thank you for paying attention to that. Justin, um, what are you having to drink, and what's your rant or your rave for today? I'll order a Boulevardier. Nice. Oh, very nice. I'm not much of a ranter, but I suppose if I have to rant about something besides the obvious, like Putin or Supreme Court. <laughs> Florida. I'm going to rant about my inability to control the space-time continuum. Uh, it's a, another week has gone by, and I still can't stop the passage of time, despite my best efforts. So that's pretty terrible. <laughs> As for raves, you know, Lee took my uh, springtime weather comment because it is so beautiful down here in South Carolina at this particular moment. But dogs, I'd like to rave about dogs. I got a dog about a year ago and he's been keeping me company and he's a lot of fun and I recommend them. Nice. Charles, what about you? What are you drinking and are you ranting or raving? Oh, in terms of the drink, I think something appropriate to American civilization as it is now, something bland and tasteless. So I would just go with a Budweiser. Noel. It's the king of beers. In a bucket. I don't even deserve a can. Just give me a Budweiser in a bucket, room temperature. My rant today is constitutional originalism. I just cannot imagine a more insipid and limited, lazy, oppressive way to think about how foundational documents should work. If it's not written on the pages of the animal skin in 1789, then it has no relevance to the society that's functioning in 2021. Absolutely drives me insane. I mean, we can go through the whole list of things that would not be a right in American culture if we went by that theory, but I'm just gonna be pissed off about the fact that there are people who sit at the highest court of the land and think this is a very serious way to interpret laws going into the 21st century. So that's my rant, constitutional originalism. I often wonder, like, what did you go to law school for if you're just going to fucking say it just means what it says, then we don't need law school. (laughs) My eight-year-old daughter can tell you what it says and doesn't say. Is that all it takes? (laughs) Well, it is a little more complicated than that, just because in addition to what's on the text, originalists say that we're supposed to pay attention to what was intended by the lawmakers. That's right. You're right. So you have to combine the reading with the mind reading. (laughs) Mm. All right, so how do I get into the mind of a Virginia slave owner of the 18th century and their thoughts on the rights of women? Hmm. I actually have somebody down the street that could tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, today's topic is philosophers on the Internet. So Lee, you want to give us a sense of what we're talking about? Yeah, you know, I've been really wanting to talk about this topic for a long time because I do think that philosophers on the internet has changed both philosophy and philosophers and maybe even the internet. (laughs) So I think that this is a really important topic. You know, for a while, there was a lot of resistance among philosophers 
to blogging, to social media, to other forms of web presence, there were a few that were out there that got on early, got on the internet early and sort of cornered the market and set the tone. And I think maybe some of us, maybe some of us here would argue that that tone wasn't a good tone. But now it's just been flooded with philosophers. We see philosophers blogging. We see philosophers on social media. We have major internet forums like The Letter Reports and Daily News, which is hosted by Justin Weinberg. He's the editor-in-chief of The Daily News, in addition to being a professor of philosophy at University of South Carolina. So there's a lot out there right now. And we need to talk about, is it good? Is it bad? What's going on? Is the internet changing philosophy? Are philosophers changing the internet? So yeah, today our topic is philosophers on the internet. There are a lot of ways to be on the internet. And I want to just kind of put this question out to all of you. What do you think it means when we say philosophers on the internet? That is, what do we mean by on the internet? I think that most people think of the internet as some form of social media. My mom thinks of the internet as email and Facebook, and that's it. And so I think most people think primarily first about social media. We all know that's a very small part of the internet, even a very small part of the web. But I think that's where most people go right away is Twitter, Facebook. That's the internet. Yeah, I, I agree that that's the popular conception of what it means to be on the internet. I'm sure we'll spend a lot of time talking about social media and philosophers on social media. But I think it's important to draw attention to other aspects of philosophers being on the internet that are important. One of which is just providing information to other philosophers about who philosophers are and what they're up to. So personal web pages and institutional web pages are a huge source of information that were just not around two decades ago. Mm -hmm. And this is good for philosophers who want to be able to see who else is doing work. It's important for prospective students. If they want to figure out where to study, they can see who's working where. And I think that provision of information by itself about who's doing philosophy and what they're up to is important. And then information about philosophy itself. So there's lots of philosophical resources online that are super important as well. Philosophers have a major presence on the internet via the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, mm. which is yeah. an extraordinarily valuable resource that has been held up as a model by the press and by other disciplines as for what a good academic resource online could be. Yeah, maybe you want to mention one other way, which is blogs. If we were having this conversation 15 years ago, I think most of us would say that philosophers' main presence on the internet is through blogs yeah. and not through social media. And there was this kind of golden age of the blogs, and I'm including my own in that, where there was a lot of interaction and a lot of like really complex and extended discussions going on on blogs. And there's still a few people who are plugging away at it and doing it very well, I think, Eric Schleiser being probably my favorite one of those philosophers. But that's died down. And those conversations that used to happen on blogs are happening on social media now. They're happening on Facebook and Twitter mostly. So I'd miss that the blogs are gone. I suppose maybe one other thing too is there's a lot of philosophy on YouTube now, which maybe counts as a social media site, but definitely doesn't come to mind immediately as a social media site in the way that, for example, Facebook and Twitter do. Have we had any philosophers break the TikTok thing yet? Yes. Really? I mean, it's a mixed bag. You know, first of all, the medium is a bit limited. But one person who seems to be particularly good at this is Paul Blaschko. Yes. Yeah, very, He's good yeah. at TikTok and good at bringing philosophical topics to the attention of TikTokers. But anyway, I wanted to go back for a second and just mention one other way in which philosophers are on the internet, which I think is important for philosophy as a profession, which is the fact that so much of our professional infrastructure is online. So you have journals, all the publishers yeah. and all their journals and fill papers as well, which is a way of finding out about articles. You have electronic books, interlibrary loans that are happening electronically. A lot of how the discipline operates is online. And that includes your traditional behind paywall stuff, but also because of the internet, open access materials. So materials becoming more accessible to everyone. And more accessible in multiple senses. If internet presence is done well, then you can make it accessible to people with different issues with vision or different issues with hearing or different cognitive issues that are not available in print media. Yeah, it's hugely important. 
I wonder, though, it seems like all of the ways that we just listed philosophers on the internet is also true of academics in almost every other discipline. Maybe we should talk about philosophers as philosophers on the internet, because it does seem to me that one of the things that maybe sets us apart from other kinds of academics and even maybe other kinds of academics in the humanities is A, the kinds of conversations that we have on the internet and B, the way we have those conversations. I think that we're seeing a lot of good come out of the kinds of conversations that philosophers have on the internet. I'm particularly excited about how much of people's unpolished ideas that we see happening in chat threads or tweet threads or whatever. And then later, you know, a year and a half later or five years later in philosophy, it's going to come out as an article. And that's really exciting. But the way that philosophers talk is maybe not our best characteristic. (laughs) Yeah. So I do think that philosophers have a way of interacting with one another. Basically, our professional training consists in learning how to criticize and take criticism. And some of our most enjoyable professional activities are traveling to a destination to present our ideas to a bunch of people whose job it is to show that we're saying something that's false. (laughs) And we like this. This is what we're into. We're kind of masochistic, I think, in the eyes of of many (laughs) others. Um, We're a very critical, self-critical discipline. And that's one of the things that makes philosophy distinctive and one of the ways in which it's good. But sometimes we can go overboard with confrontational and adversarial modes of interaction. And sometimes even when we're not going overboard, what sounds perfectly normal to other philosophers can sound extraordinarily strange to people who aren't philosophers and extraordinarily combative to people who are not Mm -hmm. philosophers. So you're right, possible communication issues. It's not us. The fact is not enough people go around and say, I have problems with what you said. I don't find any truth in it. And these are the reasons why. Maybe if more people did that, we'd find ourselves in a much more interesting country. But I also like the way, Justin, you point out that one of the major tools of our discipline is the argument. And sometimes an argument means pointing out that something someone said is false. And not a lot of people go around saying you know, I have trouble with what you just said because it seems not to be true for the following reasons. You're right, that can be read as combative. But I do want to point out that some of our colleagues are just fucking assholes. (laughs) (laughs) That is true. I think one of the things that's really difficult, and I'm going to point to Twitter here, is that so much of philosophical argumentation and just philosophy as a practice involves nuance. And it's hard to communicate nuance in 240 characters, but it's also hard to communicate nuance in text. I mean, you know, this is a 2,000-year-old point here, but it is hard to communicate nuance, especially in the course of a conversation in text. So I do think that maybe some of the most asshole-ish behavior that I see on the internet by philosophers happens on Twitter. Perhaps, yeah. So I do agree that... Twitter is a a particularly bad spot, or at least risky spot for good philosophical communication. And and part of this has to do with just the nature of the forum. So for one thing, it's very public. And when communication is very public, people have all sorts of pressures on them to make sure that they're looking good. So you'll have philosophy modes replaced with more debate mentalities. You'll have people flexing, you know, trying to look good in various ways, people putting others down. And that's just the nature of performance in front of a large audience. Not everyone is susceptible to this, but there are pressures in that direction. And you do see that. You also see that the typical kinds of behavior for the medium, which you know, Twitter is not an academic platform. It's a platform for everyone. Uh-huh. It's a, a highly political. So there's a lot of political argumentation going on. And people are often jerks to one another and mean to one another and uncharitable to one another. And even academics will use the norms for that platform as an excuse to not behave as they would in face-to-face conversation or more academic conversation. I kind of find that surprising because I guess a good rule would be don't let assholes turn you into an asshole. Mm. Yeah. And I try to follow that to the best I can. I, I would hope that others would too, but it, sometimes you see people behaving in ways that they wouldn't in person. My friend Christopher Long constantly reminds us that these various platforms and media come with their own sets of affordances and their own sets of denials, and that we need to be aware of what a particular platform or medium allows and what it doesn't allow. And I think one of the things with Twitter in particular is that there is a kind of rapidity involved in it, that 
if I don't respond to a tweet right now, then my response is not going to make sense. It's going to get lost in the crowd and so on. And so I think there's often a feeling among people that I got to put my hot take right now up on Twitter. And often your hot take is also your angry take. I think that philosophy is a discipline that requires frequently a lot more reflection than Twitter seems to allow. I agree. And I think people should resist the pressure stream. We've seen personal interactions. We've seen professional wide calamities in which what's happened is people have rushed to say something and Mm -hmm. it wasn't the most well-considered thing. And now to save face, they're digging their heels in and people's positions calcify based on feeling like they had to rush. And I think we can resist this. You can just stop. You can just shut up for a second. You can just... (laughs) Someone can be haranguing you and you can say, thank you, I'm going to think about this. And that could be the end of your conversation. Now, your interlocutor will likely be pissed off because what they're trying to do is to get a rise out of you or to get some conversation going or some entertainment. But you don't have to play these games. You can just stop. And I've had to do that sometimes where I just say, thank you, I'm going to think about this and this conversation's over. Hey, listeners, before we have too many drinks and it slips my mind, if you can't catch us at the Hotel Bar, you can catch us on Twitter at Hotel Bar Podcast. You can also follow our HBS hosts individually on Twitter to catch their all-fair thoughts. You can follow Charles at at C underscore F Peterson. And Peterson is with an O, not an E. O, not an E. Rick is at at Rick Lee Philos. That's Rick Lee with two E's and Philo spelled like half of the word philosophy. And Lee is at Dr. Lee M. Johnson. The doctor's abbreviated and Lee spelled L-E-I-G-H. Now, back to our conversation. Justin, one of the things I really appreciate about the Daily News is the way in which you go right down the middle of allowing an open and free conversation, but also it's not as if there isn't a thread of moderation in the background. And I think you have a very nice way of both allowing philosophers to be philosophers on the internet and preventing us from achieving our worst nature. And (laughs) so I'm wondering, first of all, in relation to your site, what are the main goals of sites like Daily News or The Lighter Report, Philosopher's Cocoon, virtual philosopher. What role are they playing either for philosophy as a practice or philosophy as an academic discipline or for philosophers being philosophers in public? Well, let me start by saying thanks for your nice comments. Moderating is sometimes one of the greatest challenges in terms of actually doing the moderation, but also finding the time to do it, especially on controversial topics. And it's difficult to figure out when something crosses the line or when something is so close to the line that if I allow that to go through, I'm definitely going to get an avalanche of stuff that's over the line. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, but, but I appreciate it. Not everyone is as happy as you are with how I've done on that, but uh, I'll take the compliment. <laughs> as for what the role of Daily News is, I mean, so Daily News started as a way to provide information about the profession to philosophers. There was already a source for this. It was basically just one source, uh, this lighter reports. And some people had issues with Brian Leiter, who was running that. People were concerned about the way he comported himself on the internet, his aggressiveness and some of his decisions. And it was particularly a concern because not only was he the chief clearinghouse for information about the profession, but he also created this ranking of philosophy graduate programs. And so there was this confluence of power in him, and it seemed like it might be a good idea to have an alternative. So I created an alternative way for information about philosophy to get out to other philosophers. And that's basically still the core idea. Daily News exists to share news about the philosophy profession. What are people up to? Who's gotten what grant? Where are people at? It's also a place to hash out some issues that occur in philosophy profession-wide. So issues regarding academic freedom, issues regarding sexual harassment, issues regarding what to teach and the interplay between what's going on in the philosophy classroom and what's going on in the broader world. And occasionally we actually do some substantive philosophy. 
sometimes about issues. We'll have some guest posts. And sometimes we'll do substantive philosophy in sort of the metaphilosophical sense, because the question about philosophical progress and what we're up to as philosophers comes up a fair amount. So there's this news, but it's also me, right? Because in some ways, while I have some help from various people, it's basically my site and I'm putting my perspective out there. And this manifests itself in what I choose to post about. My opinion, sometimes I'll just have opinion pieces or inject my opinion into stuff. So it's a combination of news, it's my opinion, and it's a welcoming place for other people to share their opinions most of the time and to serve as a kind of public square for philosophy in addition to social media sites. I know Justin's not going to say this, so I'm going to say it. One major difference between Justin's site, the Daily News, and the Lighter Report is that Justin doesn't use the Daily News as a bully pulpit. And I think that one of the reasons that many of us in the profession were so welcoming to the Daily News as a competitor site to the Lighter Report was because Lighter himself and his online presence had devolved in many ways into this bully pulpit. And often that bullying was focused on younger scholars, women scholars, LGBT scholars, black scholars, etc. And people just found it unacceptable. And by people, I don't just mean people in the profession. You know, the Lighter and Lighter Report's meltdown was covered in the national news. I think that one of the things that I find most admirable about your site, Justin, is your ability to not allow it to become a bully site. I wonder if you have rules for your moderation. I mean, you mentioned just before that there are things that are over the line and you won't allow, and then there are things that are very close to the line and you won't allow because they will provoke things that are over the line. But What are your guiding principles for moderation? I thought about this when I first started the site, and I wanted commenters to get into a particular mindset that was conducive to good conversation. There is a comments policy on the site, but one of its original sections was, I imagine that you're gathered with a group of other philosophers and you're sitting around a table. It's a very nice room with a nice view and you have your favorite beverage in front of you and uh, (laughs) take your shoes off, whatever. You're very comfortable. And you're going to have a conversation about various issues. And in doing so, you have someone with you, like a student or a kid, who you're trying to model a good conversation for. And so that was the mindset I wanted people to get. They're comfortable. They can appreciate how nice the world is. I mean, after all, we live in very nice circumstances, historically speaking. You know, early 21st century is just a paradise compared to much of history, you know, and especially for the kinds of people who are writing on my website. <laughs> so, so appreciate what's good in life. And that was a way of sort of toning down the anger and the crankiness and so on. But sometimes getting in that mindset is not easy. So personal attacks, I try to minimize the extent to which that happens. Sometimes I will try to protect junior members of the profession from certain kinds of negative commentary. I will try to keep people from speculating too much about what someone must be thinking or what they must be do in ways that are negative, poorly evidenced kinds of accusations are pretty bad. So basically, that's the main idea behind the moderation. Let me ask you a real specific question, though. I know that sometimes you allow anonymous comments and sometimes you insist that people include their emails with their comments. Where's the line on that? Yeah. So the reason obviously for sometimes requiring people to use their names on certain posts is to minimize the risk of people making comments that need to be moderated. It's a work management tool for me and it's a way to facilitate hopefully better conversation by holding people accountable their words. And this works to some extent. We get a lot less of the drive-by snark that I have to deal with and that's good. Mm -hmm. So on what issues do I tend to do this? Issues on which I feel like I'm likely to get a lot of either mean, uninformed, bullying or insulting or speculations with insults kinds of comments. Unfortunately, these are sometimes some of the most interesting topics. And so it's a tough call. So, for example, currently issues regarding persons who are transgender. It's a big issue in our culture. It's also a big issue in the philosophy profession. Philosophers like to ask questions about everything, and philosophers also tend to read just philosophy. And this is uh, not the best combination for issues in which very important questions related to people's lives, their identity, and their relationships with others are focused on. So on this issue, right, there's a lot of risk of slurs. There's risk of rampant disparagement. There's risk of personal insults to various particular members of the profession. And I feel like I don't have enough time to very carefully go through all this stuff. I'll just not allow comments, or sometimes I'll just require people to use their names 
as a way of deterring comments of that sort. It sounds to me that in terms of your approach, you are enacting or enabling this ideal philosophical position and posture through the work. I try. I try. I, and I had to work with the materials I got. So sometimes I'm very happy with the comments. But sometimes I'm disappointed with the comments because it can be very discouraging for people when they see comments of a sort that they don't like show up. And, you know, working with the kinds of comments I get, I, I try to do my best to maintain a kind of ideal philosophical space, less distracted by insults. And so I think that two things make the tenor of your site what it is. And one, I'm sure you're not going to be willing to acknowledge. But I think your personality comes through very clearly in the site in the same way, but in an opposite direction, that Leiter's personality came through in his site. A hundred percent agree. <laughs> and it's interesting to see that this is an abstract medium. There are bits somewhere out there. It's a technology and so on. And yet it does seem to take on a personal flavor. And one of the things I appreciate about Daily News is its pluralism in many senses. First of all, I was trained at the New School. I'm a continental philosopher. I'm a historian of philosophy. And although I think, just based on the comments that come up, that most of the people I see participating are analytically trained philosophers, I feel welcome there. I feel like my comments would be welcome there. And I think that goes partly to your personality. You're also then a pluralist in the issues you raise. You know, we could talk about metaphysics. We could talk about pedagogical issues. We could talk about epistemology. We could talk about journals closing. And those are all really important issues as well. And so I really do think one of the things that makes your site one of my go-to sites is this broadly understood notion of pluralism. Well, I appreciate that. And it's very kind of you to say, I didn't know I was signing up for a love fest here, but I'm going to take it. <laughs> <laughs> also, daily news is clever as shit. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, this is, there's a story behind the name, which is here in South Carolina, we were interviewing candidates for a job and it was over Skype yeah, back in, when Skype was used, I guess. And the candidate referred to one of his newspapers. And at first I heard this, like, what is this guy, Hearst? I mean, what? And then I realized he was talking about papers in Journal News. And, and I'm like, and that's stuck in me. So when it came time to develop a name for the site, I, I used that. And I will say that probably it's good that I didn't think it was going to be all that successful. Because I probably wouldn't have picked a silly pun title for it if I knew that it was going to be as well known as it's become. But whatever it is, what it is. As for the personality, I, I think... I think you do have to have a certain kind of personality to do this well. I mean, obviously, lots of different kinds of personalities could do something this well, but I, I think you need to have a kind of thick skin. I get lots of criticism. Mm -hmm. And in virtue of putting my opinion out there in front of thousands of philosophers every once in a while, you have to be comfortable making mistakes in front of everyone. And for various reasons, personality and social privilege and so on, I'm in a position to be like that. And so that helps. And I, I do try to be pluralistic too. And in part, that's it stems partly maybe from personality, but also from just intellectual position regarding epistemic humility. It would be remarkable if at this particular time in human history, philosophers have finally figured out exactly how to do philosophy the best possible way. I mean, wouldn't we be lucky <laughs> to be living in that era, right? I mean, all of our biases speak to us asserting that. And I think if we're self-aware enough, we have to be on guard about that. But I do have my critics and I have people who, who really just don't like me out there on the internet. It's, and it's okay. Not everyone has to like me. What? You have people who don't like you on the internet? So many people. <laughs> Shocking. Shocking. Now let's get down to the point of it all, right? The real question I think we all want to ask is, philosophers on the internet, the conversations, the discussions, the debates, the arguments... Is it for their better good or have things gotten worse in terms of the ways in which philosophers engage with each other? If I can start that part of the conversation with a quote from another philosopher. Sure. Here's the quote. This question, is the internet good for philosophy, is a silly and pointless one in my view. One might as well ask if the written word or sociality itself is good for philosophy. Does anyone know who said that? No. That was Lee Johnson. <laughs> what? <laughs> Six years ago in the comments section of Daily News. <laughs> yes, I, I had a post about this. Genius, I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> bravo, bravo. Um, yeah, I actually had a post about whether the internet is good for philosophy. So I didn't want to say anything today 
that uh, unwittingly contradicted stuff that I had said in the past. I, I'm going to change my mind. I want to be aware of it. And so I had a post to it. Is the internet good for philosophy? And my answer was not all that different from his comment there, that uh, it's a mix of, of good and bad and better and worse in various ways. But is there something about either the massification that internet technologies bring or the rapidity internet technologies allow that might, in fact, just be antithetical to the practice of philosophy as we understand it right now. And I think about when I first started really engaging online, and I initially imagined philosophy or certain types of at least academic engagement online as being similar to correspondence in the previous century. Like you can write these long, thoughtful epistles and you get the same in terms of return. And this conversation, this really studied conversation takes place over time. And that's clearly not it for, for some of the reasons that we've identified, right? You've got 10,000 people who are paying attention to this conversation and they're engaging in what initially was just a mind to mind engagement. It's terrible in many ways, but I think it's a good thing at the same time, because in a certain way, I think it can force philosophers to begin to communicate in ways that expand the reach of what we say. I think sometimes as, as much of a hell as Twitter can be, I find it a challenge to be able to be as insightful and precise as I can in 240 characters. To me, it's sharpened certain types of intellectual and, and writing skills. So I have my questions about it, but I think there's something that can ratchet up or sharpen what we do and, and who we do it for. I think that there are a number of things about the internet that have made philosophy better. And one thing I want to mention to kind of frame this is that this is a, a multi-generational moment. I mean, when else in history have you had four generations talking to one another all at the same time? That is happening now on the internet. And I think that we're seeing shifts in the practice and the norms of philosophy because the younger generations God, am I saying that? I'm only Gen X. But yes, the younger generations are very online. But I do think that one of the real positive things is that it has opened up the conversation to a lot more people. I think that you see a lot more diversity in conversations. In many ways, women's voices and LGBTQ voices and POC voices have more weight because they're on the internet. We also see that a lot of the norms of the younger generations are entering into the way that philosophy is done. I think I am particularly impressed with philosophy on YouTube. And I say this often about my students to my older colleagues. The truth is, is that these students have grown up with images, not with 500 page texts. And they may not be as good readers and writers as we would want them to be, but they are incredible at reading images and manipulating images and communicating through images. And so I think that we see a lot of really interesting things going on on YouTube with that. But the thing that I'm most impressed by is the fact that so many people can be in a conversation at the same time and move questions forward so quickly. I think to point out something Justin also mentioned earlier, the internet allows for the less expensive proliferation of the organs of our profession that our younger colleagues really need, perhaps more than ever. Mm -hmm. I think that's a tremendous benefit as well. Lee, you point out something that is important to remember and that is that our profession was not always practiced in writing long texts, in writing essays, or maybe even in writing at all. The practice of philosophy has used a wide variety of media historically, and so we can't get fixated on what some scholars call the Gutenberg parenthesis. There's also amazing networking possibilities that have never been available to underrepresented groups in the profession. Yeah. I don't know what the number is now, but I think it's something like only 12% of philosophers are women. And I can network with other women philosophers now in ways that are immensely important to me, not only intellectually, but professionally. And same goes for people of color, same goes for queer folk. And, you know, it's quite often the case that for many of us, you may be the only woman in your department, the only black person in your department, the only queer person in your department or trans person in your department. And this allows for you to have a community that, again, 
is both beneficial to you intellectually, philosophically, but as important professionally. I agree with that. I think access to the profession and its institutions is one of the great benefits of the internet. And that increased access for people who've been traditionally underrepresented, but also people who might be at institutions that are not typically thought of as the research powerhouses. So in the past, it, I think it was much more difficult for people who weren't at a top research university to get into conversations. And the internet enables that to a much greater degree. Additionally, people from around the world, right? So there's a sense in which Anglo-American philosophy dominates the profession and it can be difficult for people outside that area, the geographic regions, to break in, and the internet allows for some overcoming of that. So I think all that's good. And I just want to also say that there's some connection between various issues in the profession and substantive philosophy where the internet, I think, can make a difference. One of the things that the internet has allowed us to do as a profession is make audible to and visible to people problems that they might not have thought existed. I think sexual harassment in the profession and the treatment of women is a particular example of how in philosophy there's been a big difference. We had feminist philosophers blog and what it's like to be a woman blogged. It was an anonymous detailing of various terrible experiences usually that people underwent. There was the gender conference campaign that came out of that, which pointed out just how frequently conferences were happening with panels that were all male, you keynote know, speakers that were all male. I think a lot of this was stuff that might not have been on some people's radar and just bringing it to people's attention made it clear that there's a problem, right? The same thing I think has happened mm -hmm. to some extent with race and to some extent with disability, where we're hearing about these issues. People who haven't thought about these issues, who haven't even known that they were issues or thought they were important as issues, are now coming to see that they are problems, that they are issues, and they're coming to see that they might need to do something about that. And I think as that happens, philosophy will change too. The kinds of things people philosophize about, the kinds of issues that get traction over time, the various questions that develop can you know, all be affected by that greater inclusiveness. <laughs> Hey, we couldn't hear you while you were shouting into your headphones. So if you have feedback or suggestions for future topics, or if you just want to pick a fight with one of our co-hosts, or in fact all of us, just visit us at www.hotelbarpodcast.com and click on the interactive page. If you want to belly up to the bar with us, at least virtually, you can always email an audio clip, keep it under two minutes please, to hotelbarpodcast at gmail.com. If it's interesting, we're going to steal it from you. If it's not, we'll send you our Venmo handles and you can virtually buy us a drink. So what do we think are some best practices of philosophers on the internet? It seems like about 10 or 15 years ago, one thing that graduate advisors would tell their students is don't be on the internet, <laughs> right? You know, and it seems like now the exact opposite advice is being given. Have an internet presence, but a well-curated one. What do we think are some best practices of philosophers on the internet? I would just like to jump in and, and caution too much about this idea that your younger philosophers need to have much of an internet presence. I think it's good for there to be some place on the internet for people to find out stuff about you. It could be your department's page that's about you, and, and that could be good enough. And the reason that might be good enough is there, there are plenty of ways to advance in the profession that have nothing to do with the internet. You can write good papers, submit them to journals, get them accepted into journals, and that goes on your CV and counts much more than some clever tweet that you might have spent some, some time on, right? So. There is this very offline mode of movement, even though people might benefit from networking and so on like that. I don't want to discount the possible benefits. I just want to make clear to anyone listening who might not be so on the internet that you don't need to be on the internet in order to be successful in academia. And that's a good thing. It's another way in which our profession can be diverse. Justin, I could not possibly disagree with you more. <laughs> so, I mean, I'll, I'll just be honest. If I were interviewing candidates right now, and I Googled a candidate's name and there was nothing about that candidate that I could find other than links to their printed journal articles, I would be suspicious. Suspicious of what, though? I mean, look, I'm a technophile and I certainly have a different attitude about this than either of my co-hosts and obviously you. But I do think that it worries me that people aren't online 
in the 21st century. It worries me that they have a misunderstanding of where important conversations are happening, of where important news is happening, of how we function. It does seem like a poor inference, though, right? You can't infer from someone's lack of personal footprint on the internet that they're not consuming stuff on the internet. The inference is that they're not active on the internet, not that they're not on the internet at all. I mean, I don't know how you could be an academic and not be consuming the internet. I agree in part with Lee that... First, no one is not on the internet. And so if you're not producing the content that makes links about you come up, you're allowing other people to determine what your internet presence looks like. And so you might as well take some ownership of that. But I do agree with Justin that I can consume Twitter conversations and Facebook conversations and online news and the daily news and so on without having any contribution to the internet at all. And I have never Googled a certain candidate for a job that we've ever hired. I don't know if my colleagues are, but I have never done it. If I may, I'm just going to double down on my position here. <laughs> so I'm online a fair amount. In part, that's just running daily news, keeping track on things that I might link to or post about. People are emailing me. I'm, you know, I want to check out some interesting Twitter conversations. So I'm online a lot. Not as much as other people who are on Twitter like 24 hours a day. And when I come across someone who isn't online, I'm jealous, actually, <laughs> in part because I have to be on so, so, so much uh, for this stuff to take a prolonged break or even to have an existence that is in some ways a little old fashioned, separated from the onslaught of conversation, information, pressure to participate, seems to me one of many different kinds of good ways of being. I have one colleague in particular who spends almost no time on the internet, certainly none on social media. And he's just this brilliant, deep thinker who I love to talk with. And he's doing great professionally, even though he's not online. I'm not saying everyone has to be this way. I, I'm just saying it's good that there are some people like this. And it's really good that there's a track for people to succeed in academia that doesn't depend on their internet presence. I'm going to co-sign with Justin <laughs> on that. I think it's a professional tool. And I will say, along with Rick, that it is important that people cultivate the tools of the profession for that reason. I don't think it's a character flaw because somebody doesn't have or doesn't even want or doesn't engage in this incredible, expressive online existence. Justin, I'm kind of not jealous, but I really admire people who have been able to resist the call of the ones and the zeros and can exist outside of that. It's important in many ways. And I have Googled people, you know, applicants to positions. It's been very helpful in some ways. I realized, oh, you're not cultivating your online identity well at all because I'm learning more about it than I should know about you, mm -hmm. right? This is beyond your professional appearance. I just don't think it's a problem if people don't. I don't think there's something wrong if they're like, that's not what I do. There's still other ways, IRL, that I can cultivate and move through this profession. Well, I just want to say that I'm not jealous. I'm suspicious. <laughs> what do you think? You're like an axe murderer? <laughs> like, what do you hiding? I could probably Google that if they had actually <laughs> axe murdered someone. Not if they're good. Although I do think that overwhelmingly your collective, the three of you's view, is probably dominant in the profession I am not alone in being suspicious of people who have no internet presence. And if I had to guess, I would guess that my view is going to slowly overtake yours. Oh, of course it will. Yeah. <laughs> not slowly, quickly overtake yours. It would have to be quick if it's the internet. <laughs> I, I do think that there are some cautions here, though. So one is we don't want to mistake philosophy on the internet for philosophy in general. Right. Most philosophers aren't super active on social media. But it is the output of the most active on social media that is going to give you your impression of what philosophy is like. Uh, and it, I think it's just important to be careful about that. Just because there's some loud voices on Twitter or Facebook saying blah, 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 does it mean that every philosopher is like that or even most philosophers are like that? Even if you disagree about whether some should be or shouldn't be online, we should at least acknowledge the reality that many are not online and just be cautious about drawing inferences about what goes on online to what's happening in the rest of the yeah, fair enough. I completely agree with that. I'm suspicious of the suspicion because that would be tantamount to 70 years ago, someone making the claim that I'm suspicious of a philosopher who's not on TV. No, 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 no. That's not true because to be on TV right now means that you're a celebrity. To be on the internet means that you're social in the 21st century. 
So then I move away from my suspicion, and now I could not possibly disagree more. (laughs) Because, Lee, I'm with you that digital life is real life, but I won't go with you that if you're not online, you're not social. Okay. You to, nobody asked you to come along. I'm just saying that my but view is slowly to, overtaking yours. I always want to come <laughs> along with you, Lee. I have to agree that to not be online is not to not be social, obviously. But I do think that if I Googled someone and, again, nothing came up about them other than, like, do you want to find their address <laughs> and phone number or this is what they've published in printed journals, I would wonder, do they not interact on any social media at all? Do they not talk to their families or friends on social media? And I do think that I would wonder about the level of sociality, the manner of sociality that they have in the 21st century. I think that there's a type of personality that is engaged in this really aggressive presentation of themselves. And I think for some people, that's just not who they are. The same people who would prefer to sit in the back of a room and listen in on a conversation versus participate, or the type of people like me that during a party, I go to the kitchen and will deal with a small handful of people. That type of personality, that's not going to be the person that's going to be across all of these platforms and constantly churning out information about themselves and presenting, saying, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. I mean, I think to some degree that may be a lot of the people in this profession. They're not extroverts in that sort of way. And I think it does take a high level of extroversion to constantly churn out content about yourself. (laughs) But let me go back to how I originally set this up. I said, if I was interviewing a candidate for a job and I Googled them and couldn't find anything, I would be suspicious. Okay, so I'm interviewing somebody who's in their late 20s, early 30s, maybe. I'm interviewing them to be a professor. I'm not trying to find the best introvert that sits in a corner and listens to conversations. I'm at a Catholic university. It's primarily a teaching university. And I think that is part of what makes me suspicious, that maybe this is not a person who's well-suited for the job for which I am interviewing. So I have no problem with that, Lee, in the sense that whenever we're hiring, my colleagues use a number of differing criteria for judging something like teaching, for judging something like research. And one of the beauties of being in a department is that that mixture of the very criteria you're using to judge something, I think, makes us all better. And so I would have no problem if in our department you said, I don't think we should hire this person because they have no online presence. Yeah, and I want to say that I am not saying that everyone has to have this criteria. I am saying that this is something that figures into considerations for me. I also want to say you, Rick, are a good example of in some ways, what I'm talking about, you are technically online. If I Google your name, I can find your Facebook account and I can find your Twitter account, but you're not online in the way that I am or Charles is or Justin is. But, you know, just the fact that you have those accounts would ease my mind a little bit. So you're you're, you're hired, Rick. If you look at the last time I posted on those before we started this podcast, it was probably seven years. Still, but just having the accounts would be some salve to me. Maybe this is a dirty trick, but I have to say, Lee, I'm kind of surprised <laughs> that you're conceding so much to the dominant modes of, of being. And I figure you're more of a countercultural, alternative, friendly type of person. And it, it, the fact of the matter is that today, what counts as counterculture, probably the most countercultural one could be, is being offline. When it comes to even hiring people, I think that one of the things that we've learned not to do is hire people based on some guess as to how their personal traits might translate into a classroom environment. Because after all, one of our jobs as instructors is to help our students become well acquainted with a diversity of people. So if someone's a little bit introverted or mostly offline, it has a different mode of being, along with these other more familiar differences, and we should uh, be accepting of it, or at least open to it. Not suspicious. Okay, so a couple of things. One, I'm not saying that I would or would not hire somebody on this criterion alone. I'm saying that if I Googled somebody that I would be suspicious, that suspicion could be allayed by many other things. But to the countercultural point, this is something that I'm very critical of. I do think that there's this romanticism about being off the grid that I find totally unconvincing and honestly naive and uninformed. I am very critical of people who say, 
I'm off the grid for whatever principled reasons, because A, they're not off the grid, and B, just to repeat what Rick said earlier, they're simply letting someone else manage and cultivate and honestly profit off of the manner in which they are on the grid. Okay, so just two points to follow up. One, I think we should resist as much as possible the pressures on image duration. I think people are under a significant amount of pressure to cultivate some picture of themselves and Rick, you expressed this worry about letting others do it for you. But I think what we should be on guard about is letting the internet influence too much our judgments of people based on what Google shows us. And why are we trusting these corporations to give us an accurate picture, a deep, rich understanding of people, when all they're going to be showing us is what's in their interests to show us? So I think we should resist the push towards curation by making it less important, to the extent we can, how we appear on the internet. But Lee started off this section asking about good practices. And I thought maybe I could just mention a couple that I think are important. One is take a break every once in a while from the internet. <laughs> I think just yeah. recharge. This is not necessarily to romanticize non-online life. And I think he's right to caution about that. But I think it is just part of getting a variety of experiences and engagements with human beings that can help you do online stuff better. Another thing would be, as I said before, don't let the assholes turn you into an asshole. You have your own standards for how you want to comport yourself with others, and you don't have to let what others are doing or what the norm is, even for that platform, dictate how you interact with others. That's completely up to you. And then third is philosophers, especially. I think one of the things philosophers are particularly good at is showing how things are complicated and difficult. And I think that when we're engaging with other philosophers and also with the public online, a good practice is to be explicit and honest about the difficulty and about the complications and prioritize that over pushing a particular view. I think that's good for conversations and it's good for philosophy in the long run as well. We're going to wrap things up, but before we do that, we want to give a shout out to the philosophers on the internet that we think are engaging in great content and great practices. So, Rick, do you want to start us off? So I'm going to cheat here a little bit. I think that Lee is someone who had an incredibly early online presence in the form of a blog that I would read all the time. And I think Lee has now moved off of blogging to other outlets for her internet presence. But I think that was a really great example of best practices. And then I'll shout out again my friend Christopher Long, who, for other reasons, namely he's a dean now, doesn't seem to be as active as he used to be. But I think he was a philosopher who was online, a champion of philosophy online, and did it in a particularly constructive, productive, and excellent way. All right, Lee? In terms of internet forums, Justin is my favorite person on the internet. Daily News is something that I regularly check. In terms of Facebook, T. Nguyen is my favorite philosopher. On Twitter, I would say Liam Bright is probably my favorite philosopher. On YouTube, it's Abigail Thorne, the philosophy tube person. And in terms of blogging, I really love Eric Schleiser's blog. I don't know how that man produces the amount of work that he produces. And then I guess finally, in terms of podcasts besides this one, I really do love John Donaher's podcast. All right, Justin, any suggestions, any recommendations? Well, so um, I do blogging, but I also like a lot of other philosophy blogs. And even though I agree that the heyday of substantive philosophy blogging might be behind us, all these, these things wax and wane, there are a couple of good ones still out there. Eric Schleister's Digressions and Impressions that we mentioned is one. Eric Schwitzkebel's blog is, is another very good individual blog. There are a couple of group blogs that I think are, are quite interesting and good too. Aesthetics for Birds is one. The Brains blog, doing stuff with philosophy of mind and cognitive science. Uh, Junkyard, which does philosophy of imagination. Those are some good examples of ongoing collective blogs that produce interesting substantive material. For Twitter, you know, I was going to say Liam Bright as well, because he's just this remarkable combination of erudition, humor, self-deprecation, and kindness. I think he does a very good job of modeling one way to really be, I think, successful and welcoming and, and fun. When it comes to some other kinds of modes of interaction, I think High Nation is a podcast by Barry Lamb. Just a really wonderful yeah. thing that he's done with that. You know, Natalie Wynn, who was a philosophy graduate student, has gone on to produce a whole bunch of YouTube videos under the name ContraPoints. And I think she does some very interesting, provocative, and well-produced and fun stuff. 
people have used the internet to get people together. Uh, Zena Hits with her Catherine project. It's a group, basically a way of getting people together to read classics in philosophy. I should give a shout out to Joshua Smart, who for many years now has been coordinating a dissertation writers group, which gets students who are working on the dissertations from different places, which there might not be a good core group of people working in their area, putting them in touch with one another. And then you have people who are able to use the kind of information on the internet in their philosophical work in various interesting ways. Sometimes this is done in experimental philosophy for surveying and stuff like that. The one person I think who's done a particularly good job of making use of online information is uh, Mark Alfano, who has produced a whole lot of data-based philosophy by using the kinds of digital humanities tools that weren't available pre-internet. So there's a lot out there. What about you, Charles? I do like Aesthetics for Birds. That, that's a great blog. I really enjoy their stuff. I like our friend Jason Reed, Unemployed Negativity. Oh, yeah. So I like his blog. I also follow him on Twitter. He's absolutely hysterical. Uh, I really like following Olafemi Taiwo. I think he's doing great work. I love seeing mm. um, what he's into. You know, it's linked to interviews and podcasts that he does. I follow Robin James. I think they're doing great work. So, you know, it's not a huge online philosophical consumption, but I enjoy the, the people that I'm following. All right. So before we wrap it up here, we just want to remind everybody that you can kick a few dollars back our way by visiting our Patreon page. And this week, we got lucky we got a a designated driver, someone who's showing some sympathy on our state. Kevin Kimball, one of our new Patreon supporters, is tonight's designated driver. So thanks, Kevin. Appreciate the ride. And Justin, thank you so much for coming. It's nice to see the man behind the machine. (laughs) It's been a real pleasure. Thanks for having me on. And and again, thanks for all the compliments. I'm going to keep those with me and I'm going to forget all the negative stuff you said. (laughs) (laughs) Perfect. All right, guys. We'll see you next time. Shotgun. (laughs) 